Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, we noticed from Leanne's introduction and the first slide that I've been uh, interested in bryophytes for even longer than I've been a member of this society, which is quite a considerable length of time. Uh, to say, I work uh, at the Natural History Museum where a plastic dinosaur has been replaced by a real whale, uh, which is called Hope, if in case you wondered uh, why the Hope was on there. And in the main hall of the museum, Hintzy Hall, uh, the provenance of uh, the, the whale and the uh, arrangements in the museum uh, don't bear too close scrutiny because where Hintzy got his money is a little bit dodgy. But that's another subject. Mm. Right, where are we today, bryophytes? Second most specious group of land plants. A lot of them. 10,000 mosses, 6,000 liverworts, 200 hornworts. The UK has a very good bryophyte flora. Uh, 300 liverworts, 680 mosses, but only four hornworts. So there are a lot of them. So... I'm going to try and answer some fundamental questions today about them. What are they and why are they so small? If we're interested to look at London, uh, when you think about it, uh, at first sight this looks like a remarkable case for optimism. Middlesex has about 200 bryophytes. And uh, a lot of things have been added uh, this century about 150 on Hampstead Heath. Those who are going on the excursion will not see 150 different bryophytes. It takes a lot of walking around and a lot of crawling. So why am I interested in bryophytes? Why would anybody be interested in bryophytes? Well, one reason is natural curiosity, wanting to identify things and I see them, looking at their global importance, mainly how they work, how their evolution, excuse for travel and adventure, uh, able to do research on the doorstep. And the other thing about them, we shouldn't forget, is they are exceedingly beautiful. I think that is exquisite. That moss, and here's another one, which is equally exquisite. So in today, today's presentation, I'm going to talk about what bryophytes are, how they work, a bit about their evolution, and then finish up talking about London and what's happening in London. Uh, I owe a great deal uh, to the hunter-gatherers, the, the workers, the sort of bryologists at the coal face. These are the members of the British Bryological Society, and there are 700 of us, and these are action pictures. I'm hoping that one of these days, you know the thing that comes on before the 10 o'clock news of silly people doing silly things? Well, I'm hoping we can get the bryologist to do a, a similar lineup. I think it would be good. Uh, so I acknowledge the bryologists. And uh, some of you probably didn't realise how deeply embedded in literature bryophytes are. If you read those two quotes, you'll realise just how we worked that one out, where they came from. There is a corner of an arable field that is forever England. When a bryologist is tired of London, he, she is tired of life. Global importance. Are bryophytes important globally, or are they just the realm of weirdos like me, eccentric botanists? They are incredibly important in global terms. This is a sphagnum bog in Tierra del Fuego, a pristine uh, sphagnum bog. Some of you might not know, but 6% of the carbon, the world's carbon, is locked up in sphagnum, living and dead. It's a very important that we don't get rid of the carbon that's fixed in uh, sphagnum bog. Uh, that was in Tierra del Fuego. Uh, this is sphagnum on Hampstead Heath, and those who are going on the excursion uh, should be able to see that. There are two species of sphagnum. There's a reddish one there and a, a paler green one on the Kenwood bog. What are bryophytes? Now, this is the really technical bit. They are spore-producing poikular hydric land plants with an alternation of generations where the gametophyte is dominant. You've all got that, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> I knew it, yes. Uh, other land plants are called vascular plants. Some are spore-producing ferns and lycopods. 
and seed producing land plants, conifers and flowering plants. The big word you're stuck on there is poikula hydri. Poikula hydri is the ability to withstand desiccation. That is to say, under drying conditions, the plants dry out and they can survive drying out. The alternative to poikula hydri is homeohydri, where plants maintain their water balance. Most of the plants we see around us today are homeohydric, but bryophytes are poikula hydrate, they withstand desiccation, and this imposes major restrictions on the growth of bryophytes and explains basically why bryophytes are little green things. So the point of poikula hydra is it imposes severe limits on growth because when the plants are desiccated, they don't metabolise, they're quiescent. And they can stay quiescent and re rehydrate within minutes and start growing again. And it would surprise you that, you know, I went all the way to Monument Valley. Why did I go to Monument Valley? I went to see the bryophytes and to perform a high-tech experiment. Not many people go to Bri Monument Valley to look at the bryophytes, but this is a bryophyte, a moss growing in the desert in Monument Valley, uh, all dried up, and there's the high-tech experiment of pouring water on it, and bottom right, it rehydrates, and that plant is growing and metabolising, having been dried for months and months. You don't have to go all the way to Monument Valley. Uh, you can look at walls in London and you see the same thing. This is a common... Uh, London wall moss. This is the hydrated state here, and this is the dehydrated state. There's another common wall moss, and this is the hydrated state and the dehydrated state. Why am I using Latin names? I use Latin names because this is how bryologists communicate. They do not communicate with English names. They haven't a clue about English names. So when an item appears on the news dealing with a bryophyte and they talk about the bryophyte using an English name, bryologists do not have a clue what they're talking about. Uh, how about the English names for azalea, rhododendron, for scythia and liquid amber? Well, I don't know the English names for some of those. <laughs> you might. So this, bryophytes are small because they're poikula hydric. It imposes major restrictions on growth. Onset of water stress, they dry out. And then they rapidly resume metabolism on rewetting. And we know all about what governs desiccation and how they recover. One of my research students, who's now the chief bryologist at the museum, did her PhD on this. The biggest bryophyte uh, in Britain, and in fact I think in the world, is this one, Polytricum communi, grows up to a metre in height, and if we, we might see this on the, on the heath this afternoon, Hampstead Heath, it's rather nice. The life cycle of bryophytes. Now, the life cycle is a dominant gametophyte, which is a, a leafy plant which produces gametes, a sperm fertilises an egg and grows into another generation called a sporophyte, which sits on the gametophyte. So, sort of drawing of this, the normal plant you see is a leafy plant which produces sex organs, male sex organs, female sex organs, biflagellate sperm, which fertilises an egg, then an embryo develops and grows into this other generation, the sporophyte, which produces spores by uh, meiosis, which grows back into uh, the leafy plant by a juvenile phase called a protonema. And so if we look at this one here, uh, this uh, common moss, uh, this is the gametophyte, produces the gametes, and these are the sporophytes sitting on top of the, the gametophyte. The good thing about going, giving talks on bryophytes, you get a chance to show a lot of nice pictures, don't you? What are the differences between mosses and liverworts? Mosses are leafy and have complex sporophytes. Liverworts are either thalloid and have simple sporophytes, as I'll show you. Hornworts are thalloid and have horn-shaped sporophytes. 
Right, this is a liverwort, common liverwort, Marcantia polymorpha, uh, greenhouse weed, uh, grows in cr pavement cracks throughout London, and it has, these are gamma cups, these are, produce asexual propagules called gemmae, which are splash dispersed out of these cups. In Marcantia, the gamma cups are round, and in this uh, related genus, another thalloid liverwort, Lunularia, it's called Lunularia because the gamma cups are lunate, half moon shaped. So those are two very typical uh, leafy liverworts, very common in London. Uh, this is a, a this, sorry, the thalloid liverworts. This is a, a leafy liverwort. Uh, this is the biggest leafy liverwort in Britain that was growing on Ben A in the Scottish Highlands. They're extremely beautiful as well. Uh, the differences between liverworts and mosses. Mosses are leafy and have complex sporophytes. Liverworts are either thalloid or leafy and have simple sporophytes. And hornworts have horn-shaped sporophytes. This is a, the next, next slide is a uh, hornwort, uh, sorry, a, a liverwort. This is the biggest liverwort in the world. And these are the sporophytes here. And basically they're stalks uh, with a bag of spores at the end. This is an undehist one, this is a dehist one, uh, liberating the spores. So basically a very simple construction. It's a sort of a stalk and a bag of spores at the end. Whereas in mosses we have a much more complicated structure. This is in moss politricum here. And sorry. What have I done? Sorry. This is the this is the sporophyte, and we look at the sporophyte, it's highly complex structurally. Uh, a great deal to it, and I could give a whole lecture on the structure of the sporophyte. It's have a lid uh, which lifts off and the spores are liberated via a complex think, structure called a peristome. This is the sphagnum moss, which has complex sporophyte again. These are the sporophytes of sphagnum here. And they're explosively discharged their spores in the summer. Uh, This is the sporophyte of sphagnum here, uh, which has a complex structure, and the spores are liberated uh, when these explode in the summer. Most mosses have a structure called a peristome, which consists of a series of teeth, which are hygroscopic. When it's dry, the teeth are out like this. When it's wet, they're like this. And uh, we should see this. We might see one or two examples of this if you've got a hand lens on the heath, because you can go, uh, uh, and you can actually see the peristome closing when you, uh, when you breathe on it. Uh, but they're exceedingly pretty. They really are uh, beautiful things. These were taken as the Natural History Museum, these peristomes which open and close. So it's a complex structure. And the difference, say, between the moss and the liverwort is that the sporophytes in mosses are complex, whereas liverwort is just bags of spores at the top of a stalk. On the other hand, this is the only picture I'm showing of a hornwort. This is a hornwort, and in the hornwort, the sporophytes are shaped like horns. So... What on earth goes on at the Natural History Museum? Well, what's happening with bryophytes at the Natural History Museum is that where the focus of bryological research at the Natural History Museum is uh, at land plant evolution. And the key evolution, uh, of the evolution of the key innovations of land plants. Uh, it might surprise you that people have been working on for this for a long time, about land plant evolution. Uh, even with all the tools, modern tools and all the tools of morphology and now molecules, we still uh, haven't resolved what really happened at the bottom of land plant evolution. We know that mosses, liverworts are, and hornworts are right at the bottom of the land plant tree. But we don't know, and the vascular plants came later, but we don't know which was the earliest. We do know they were pretty early, 470, 480 million years ago. And there are two liverworts in particular, uh, which seem to be uh, firmly rooted at the bottom of the liverwort tree. So the question is, what was first? Was it a hornwort, with your nice horns here? Or was it a liverwort uh, like this one here, Troibia? Or was it particularly... OK, so what were the ancestors, just in case you don't know? The uh, land plants came from freshwater algae. Uh, freshwater algae rather like this, which is cara of freshwater alga. Uh, the main route for terrestrialisation 
was fresh water. A route onto land from the sea uh, is not the uh, best way of doing it because dealing with uh, high salt concentrations on land come out of the sea is a big problem. And there are very few organisms that can, can do this, can cope with the transition from uh, the sea to the land. Perhaps the best you can get are the salmonid fishes and eels, which have part of their life cycle in the sea and part are, are in fresh water. But the, the ancestry of land plants is definitely from freshwater algae. And we're interested in the key innovations of, of land plants. Uh, and there are several of these. One is placentas. You might not know, but uh, mosses and all land plants have a phenomenon known as matrotrophy. They look after their own babies. They, the, the mothers uh, nurture their babies. Land plants have waterproof cuticle, which restricts water loss. They have stomata, with pores, which uh, minimise water loss and uh, facilitate gaseous exchange to the cuticle. Then they've got food, they've got conducting cells, cells, particular cells, which conduct food and water. And then there are two strategies, poikula hydri, which you now know, all know about, versus homia hydri. And another very important aspect of land plants is fungal symbioses. And the ones we're really concentrating at the museum on stomata and the fungal symbioses. Here's some stomata. These are the pores which, uh, where there's ga regulation of gaseous exchange. And in vascular plants, the stomata open and close, depending on waters. Con prevailing water conditions and a hormone called abscisic acid, a stress hormone. So these are stomata. A ni another nice picture of the pores, sections through the pores. Uh, these are the two stomata, these are the stomata, which are two cells called guard cells, and they open into internal uh, chambers inside. Uh, these are all mosses, I mean mosses, and mosses. They're very beautiful. And then there are fungal symbioses, and uh, really staggering how views have changed on fungal symbioses. Land plants have been associated with fungi uh, since the Devonian, perhaps the Ordovician, and uh, the most abundant fungal symbiosis is known as an arbuscular mycorrhizal association. 70 to 90% of land plants have got these. And we all thought until about 11 years ago that all the fungi belonged to one uh, phylum, the glomeromycota. And this had been an, an idea that had been around for about 30 years. Today, really as a result of sort of work on bryophytes, we have a very different story. In fact, it's not the glomeromycotes, but another group of fungi, the mucoromycotina, which are the earliest uh, fungal symbionts in land plants. And this is a wonderful example of scientific collaboration between Sylvia Pressler at the museum, who the cytologist and grows the things, uh, Martin Bittertondo at Kew and Imperial, who's a molecular ecologist, and Katie Field in Leeds, who does physiological experiments, and has got these nice uh, chambers where you can grow uh, plants at elevated CO2. Instead of growing them at 400 parts per million today's conditions, she grows these plants uh, under the conditions where they evolved 480 million years ago, when they're about 1,800 parts per million CO2. And a lot of the things we've, ex a lot of the plants we've uh, experimented on, uh, a lot of the experiments have been done on this plant at Haplometrium. Uh, uh, this has underground axes which are full of fungus, and the fungus looks extremely pretty. Uh, just scanning electron micrographs of the fungus. And this functions, this is a mucoromycote fungus, which functions very differently from the uh, glomeromycote fungi. So we've got a, a completely new look at the evolution of fungal symbioses. And so that's a subject in itself. And finally, though, I'll come on to London and try and look at why have bryophytes increased in London? Why are there these major changes? When I first came to London in the 1960s, it was a pretty grim place for bryophytes. Uh, there were mass extinctions in the 19th century because of particularly bryophytes and lichens growing on trees. And this is because uh, nutrients from rain, in particular SO2, had killed everything. And so we had bare trees and dirty bark. 
I mean, some of you are just about old enough to remember those days, I think. Uh, Battlesea Power Station, <laughs> pumping out uh, you know, pollution. Uh, and remember, remember the days, in those days, in the 60s, you, you go up to a London plane tree, and you looked at a London plane tree, uh, the old bits of bark were black, and the new bits are white. Now, if you look at London plane trees, uh, the bits of bark, the different uh, layers, are, are much more the same colour. It's changed very dramatically. So dirty, dirty bare trees, and uh, very famous uh, sort of London botanist uh, Ted Wallace. Uh, he, throughout his life, documented declining London bryophytes. It's a pity he didn't live a bit longer, because things have changed then since then. London 2008. It's a picture of London in 2008. Uh, there came the Clean Air Acts. And by 2005, all the species that had disappeared in the 19th century had returned. That's all, all but four. And there were huge changes in bryophyte distribution. And there are, some are related to clean air and some are related to climate change. Uh, I couldn't resist that dig. <laughs> So, uh, what Donald Trump could not understand. This is a distribution map of a moss in the 1960s. This is the distribution of the same moss today. It's a bit dramatic, isn't it, that change? Uh, and what you notice here, there's, it wasn't doing terribly well around London, but now it's all over the place. Uh, this is a tree in Highgate in Pond Square in Highgate, and this is the moss, Orthotrichum lali, uh, growing on this tree. I say, when I was young, you'd never ever have seen that. Another, this is a liverwort, an epiphytic liverwort, Frulania dilatata, uh, which in the past, you know, was 1960s distribution. Look, look at how how rare it was in the, sort of, in the sort of industrial areas of Britain. And that's the distribution map today. And it's staggeringly different. Uh, actually, within about half a mile of here, I could actually show you this moss growing, this liverwort growing on a tree. But it's staggering, the, the big difference in distributions. And that's due to clean air. There are other distribution changes which are related to climate change. There is this, uh, I remember when I was uh, young and enthusiastic uh, going to Cornwall to see this particular minute liverwort because in the 1960s it was restricted to Cornwall. If we look at it today, it really has changed its distribution. 1960s was just down here, 1960s uh, it really has spread and now uh, there are two or three places on Hampstead Heath. It's turned up on Hampstead Heath in the last five years. And that's really sort of climate change in your face. London is still changing, uh, staggering the way the skyline changes. This is 2008 and this is 2019. It's, it, it is remarkable, isn't it, how, how things have changed. And what's the latest change? The latest change is nitrogen oxides and ammonia. So by 2005, all the bryophytes had returned. But since 2005, another big change has taken place. There's been a massive increase in epiphytic bryophytes on main roads in London. Uh, as Bob Dylan put it, a uh, well-known song, that the trees there are changing. And they certainly are. And... Uh, I couldn't resist it. I went out this morning. This is a picture of, from Highgate of central London this morning. Uh, this is here. You'd really get a good feel for just what NOx and ammonia is doing to the London environment. Uh, so I was reticent to come down here because it's much clearer in Highgate. That is a map of nitrogen oxides. It's about three or four years old. And you really get a feel there. Uh, the redder the thing is, the more nitrogen oxides there are. Uh, this is Heathrow. Not a good place to be. Uh, and you see how, how nitrogen oxides pick out all the, all the major roads.
But strange as it may seem, what has happened since we've had this nitrogen pollution, the number of epiphytes growing on trees in London has increased. At the turn of this century, you would never have seen a plane tree on the main road in London covered with tree, covered with epiphytes like that. It really is uh, quite remarkable uh, how things have changed. And one moss in particular has increased. This is in the 1960s. Uh, it was sort of lots of hollow dots. Do you know when you're old as a biologist? Uh, you're, you're old when you see a, what a dot, which is one of your records, becomes hollow. <laughs> hollow dots indicate that they're old, they're old records. When your, your records are hollow, you're old. Uh, this is a moss which was sort of widely extinct in huge areas. Now, this is the current map for it. Uh, I just come back with a vengeance. Uh, the nearest place to see, there's a tree outside Euston Station with tons of it on there. We might see this in Hampstead Heath this afternoon. So this is really a dramatic story of how much things have changed. So looking to the future, we have a problem. There are no botanists left in universities uh, to record what's going on. How many professional botanists do you think there are in British universities today who are able to identify bryophytes? And I have a problem with the media. The media are phonocentric and fluorophobic. Those are a couple of neologisms you perhaps hadn't heard before. Uh, how many times does Attenborough mention plants on his programmes? It's all big furry things. It doesn't mention the green stuff. But for the green stuff, the big furry things wouldn't be there. So I have problems with the, I have problems with the media. This is a very common moss, which we we'll see on the heath, if you go on the heath. So, and I ask the question, how many academics in British universities could recognise this? I think you'd be lucky to count them on the fingers of one hand. Uh, I dug out this old photograph especially for you. This is a picture of the professors of botany in Britain in 1982. Uh, there are various things you notice about this, this photograph. One is the lack of females, one here, uh, one here. It's very male dominated. Fortunately, it's not quite as bad as that. Now, uh, the other things to notice is most of them are wearing ties. Uh, uh, so, that photograph contains 32 professors, uh, two females, 32 males, two females. How many today? Uh, there are less than 10 professors of botany in Britain today. Botany is very much a subject that's been marginalised. That's staggering when you consider about 139 universities and, and 10 universities in London. So a big fear for the future is that there's a lot happening with plants, but there's nobody around uh, to do the work. So if there's a sort of message from this talk is, we badly need more botanists. Thank you.